What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Grafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in today's episode is John Borthwick, the founder and CEO of Betaworks. John is not only a friend, but also a brilliant and wonderful human being. He was one of my very first guests back when the podcast first launched in 2017, when we spoke about the challenges and opportunities present in the fields of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and how to progress technologically into this immersive future of superintelligence, disembodied consciousness, and simulation in a way that wouldn't cause us to lose touch with our humanity. The incredibly rapid adoption of ChatGPT has caused me to revisit these questions, And I asked John to come back on the podcast so that we could revisit them together and consider whether that immersive future that we spoke about then has finally arrived. How we would even know it and what the appropriate response to the current moment is for the public, for companies investing in this technology, and for governments seeking to regulate and exploit it is the subject of the episode's second hour. If you want access to that part of the conversation and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second half of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners. You can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io, and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this incredibly thoughtful and deep conversation with my friend, John Borthwick. John Borthwick, welcome back to Hidden Forces. Dimitri, thank you. It's so (laughs) great, my friend, to see you again and to have you on the show. It's been probably five years, a little more than five years. One of my memories from that conversation was that you had recently created your own bot called Botwick. Yes, true. Do you still have that bot? No, I don't. I don't have that bot. But I, the only thing I remember about Botwick is that if you ask Botwick, are you an AI? Botwick would say, are you an investor? <laughs> yes, I remember that. Yeah, I so, thought that was awesome. It was yeah. like one of the early lo- small language models. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, scripted. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, John, for people who haven't heard our past episode, and I was telling you, I actually tried listening to it, and I was so horrified by listening to myself that I had to stop. You were great, as always, but so I don't necessarily encourage people to go back to that episode. And in order to discourage them even further, maybe the best thing that would be for you to, you know, just kind of tell people a little bit about you. Like, what's the John Borthwick TLDR? Who are you? What's your deal? What do you do? So I live in New York. I have a wonderful family that I spend as much time as I can with here in New York. I started a company about 16 years ago called Betaworks. Mm -hmm. And Betaworks was really, I set it up because I wanted to both build companies and also invest in the sort of emerging, you know, next generation of consumer tech that I saw sort of starting to come on the horizon 15 years ago, 16 years ago. So we got really involved with the social web early. It was like Web 2.0 period that was around that time. Yeah, it was just the beginning of Web 2.0. So, you know, we helped build a company that Twitter uh, bought as their search engine. And this was when there were 10 people at Twitter. And so it was, Twitter was a tiny company. And then we created something called Bitly, which was the short URL system. Mm -hmm. That was a company that we built and that became really popular through Twitter and elsewhere. 
And then, you know, fast forward, we built other companies, you know, amazing good fortune to work with great entrepreneurs, founder of Kickstarter, David Karp, founder of Tumblr. So we were very involved in the early social web, particularly here in New York, built companies like Giphy, Darts. And today we are still here in New York, still doing a lot of startup stuff, building, I would say, proportionally building less and investing more. We also run accelerator programs, so very active in the startup community mm. and doing a lot now in AI. You know, we have been, you know, about seven years ago, eight years ago, we started looking at the intersection of machine learning and uh, different modalities, you know, voice, text, vision, all these sort of modalities. And we started looking at that as areas sort of next generation tech. And, you know, back then we called it just machine learning. Today, you know, that's all been, you know, replaced with the term AI, which sort of is now the blanket term which covers most of this. So doing a lot of stuff in the AI space, mm. doing quite a bit of stuff in sort of metaverse uh, related space. So mm. a lot of tech, a lot of life. What do you think the public hears when or understands when they hear the term AI or artificial mm. intelligence? And how does that differ from people who are actually working in the field? So the term AI, you know, I for a long time it was sort of disciplined myself with data scientists and with the engineering community to sort of refer to narrow AI, to generalized AI and like and to separate out machine learning and to really avoid using the word AI mm. unless it was very specifically applied to something. You know, thanks to both the combination of the business, Hollywood, and just sort of how we've sort of fast forwarded into this era, it's now a blanket term that is being applied to all of that and more, right? So it's being used very generally. I would say, how do people understand it? I mean, I think that, you know, a couple of years ago, most of the understanding was sort of filtered through, you know, Hollywood, like her, ex machina, mm. you know, sort of like movies about this. I think now it's, you know, with the, you know, extraordinary adoption and growth of visual models first last year, DALI, stability, and then the launch of ChatGPT and a sort of like massively scaled textual model. I think that, you know, reportedly you know, hundreds of millions of people have, you know, tried this now. The fastest adoption in history. And before that, I think it was TikTok. I'd Crazy. Fastest adoption. It's just like, I mean, I, I think a lot of it you need to, the way I think about it is the, the internet's kind of been the bootloader for this. And so from a technical perspective and the data perspective, all of this AI technology has sort of fed off the internet, right? Mm -hmm. All the images, all the text, everything which you've written on the internet, which you, you know, people put up images, they put up associated tags with those images for search optimization. All of that has been farmed into the AI, but into these tools. Coupled with that is that I think from a sort of abstract sort of metaphorical level, you know, the interface of something called chat GPT, right? We have for the last you know, 10 years, you know, we text all the time, we understand what chat is. It's become a very familiar interface. And so that interface, which is somewhere between chat and search, mm. is now, I think, becoming a new discovery interface into the internet. And, you know, this is, in my mind, this is the biggest shift in technology that I've seen in my lifetime and probably will see in my lifetime. Really? Yeah. Yeah. This will change everything. I am not of the sort of, you know, a, the I'm very, iterative improvement in large language models specifically. I think the iterative improvement of specific models around all the different categories and modalities of media, mm -hmm. from visual models to language models to video to synthetic data to all of this, and then the ability to be able to go across all these models and tie them together. But yes, the large language models. Look, language is the connective, you know, tissue and API of our like of our mm -hmm. species, mm. right? And and now we've introduced a machine interface into that. Mm. You think about the most mundane things, right? You think about I don't know healthcare. You think about education. You think about law. 
and you think about the ability for a you know law clerk to be able to you know use one of these tools to be able to transcribe to be able to think to be able to actually build a case mm. to be able to look at case law to be able to search case law you know you very quickly like say wow it's going to change all of law mm. wait change all of accounting wait healthcare you know you just go systematically through every vertical i think this is it builds off the internet like i said it's sort of the bootloader of the internet bootloaded this but it is going to transform our world and it's happening really quickly because the building blocks are in place and so it's sort of exponential curve on top of exponential curve that like driving massive massive very quick change it seems like it's caught even people in the field by surprise yeah i think so I mean, the shift and the wave that started building was 2017 and the advent of transformers. But you know, you talk to experts, which I am certainly not in the field, technical experts, and many of them have been genuinely surprised in the last 18 months at the pace. And then I would say specifically in the last like three months, you know, you have some of these sort of iconic figures in the space, like Hinton, right, Jeffrey Hinton, mm. you know, who have expressed you know, real concerns about, you know, safety. Some, yeah, safety and some of the emergent properties, right? And so, which I think are, you know, starting to come out of these models. Yeah. So what, uh, we can explore some of those. Before we do, um, what do you think the kind of major bottlenecks are or constraints are in the field currently that have either held it back or are currently holding it back? The bottlenecks that are holding it back. I mean, so is it just data? Because that's been kind of one of the working hypotheses that these models just need enough data. They just need to be trained long enough on large enough amounts of data with enough computational power. And at some point, they're just going to get it, right? Yeah. Because we don't really have a working model. We don't have a clear idea of how they come to many of the answers that they come to, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the constraints are being... So just to make sort of place this in a simplistic framework is that there were, you know, several schools of thought around how AI could develop, right? And one was sort of this computationalist neural network approach. Symbolic logic. And then the other was kind of the symbolic, right? And expert systems, symbolic layers, and, you know, my quaint little Botwick chat, mm. right, which was scripted, right, which mm -hmm. had a symbolic architecture to it where it basically said, if you somebody asks a question of this ilk, give this answer, mm -hmm. right? So a group of people who, you know, have invested over the last, like, seven years massively in the computational side of this equation. And, you know, I think that it is, when you talk about people being surprised, people are genuinely surprised about how effective that has been. I've been kind of amazed and surprised. And even people like Sam Altman, who's running the company OAI, which, you know, also named OpenAI, but confusingly not really open. But OAI is you know, a leader in this space, and they've done incredible job of, you know, scaling compute. And like you said, you're starting to see sort of emergent, almost said behavior, you've got to be very careful about your words mm. with this, but sort of emergent properties mm. from these models. But it's working far better. This approach is working far better than anybody thought. Yeah. I mean, we, we were talking about that before we got into the studio, like the example of chat GPT being prompted, not even being prompted with a specific thing to reflect on, but just kind of to reflect on the answer that it gave. I think this is GPT-4 and reflecting on that and finding an error and actually revising what it originally said. Yeah. I think that would qualify as an emergent behavior, right? That's not something that had been planned for Yeah, or that we really understand how it's doing that. Yeah. I think that we've seen, you know, the first back in the GPT-3 era, right, a couple of years ago, I was amazed at they could do simple math. Because again, the model's just being trained on language, right? It hasn't doesn't. It's basically like a giant autocomplete. Right, it is. It's predicting the next word. Can you tell that? I mean, for people that aren't familiar with this, because you mentioned transformers, and now we're talking about just on a basic level how these work. Can you just tell people on a very basic level what large language models are, how this kind of predictive text works? Yeah. So in 
and again, I'm sure I'm going to do a crude job of this, but the these models, they crawl massive amounts of data from the public internet. And so you could take sources like Wikipedia or sources like Reddit, but just generally the whole public internet, they take all of this data and they place this into a sort of, think about it, I think about it sort of as a multi-dimensional space. And then they use predictive modeling to understand the associative relationship between words. And so from an output standpoint, you know, when you interact with them, they are, as you were saying, basically just predicting the next word in the sentence, what is going to come after this, right? But there's no sort of mental model or symbolic structure around There's that. a kind of statistical structure that they've been able yeah. to derive from this extremely large data set that it continues to amass. Right. But what is amazing is that you are starting to see mental models mm. start to appear, right? So, you know, I was listening to a interaction, and we can put this in the footnotes if you want, uh, between an author this week who was playing around with GPT-4 and exploring the concept of theory of mind. Mm. And, you know, if you talk to a human being, you know, they have a theory of, you know, this physical space, they have a theory of New York City, they have a theory of a particular conversation, they have a theory of the interactions that we're having. If I say half a sentence, you have a theory, you develop a theory on why I'm- We're you, modeling you, the you, other brains, and yes. if you want to make it yeah. a very crude sort of, we're and, modeling other people's minds. Right. And what you're seeing in these interactions is that there is a, uh, there's an emergence of that, which is truly remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, okay, how far does this go? because we didn't expect it to go this far. Mm. So how far can it go? And I think that, you know, the degree to which this has surprised people, I think has been, you know, it's one of those things that's both been overplayed and has also been underplayed, right? Like one of the things that has become fairly evident in the last few months is that Google, who are like definitely one of the, you know, gonna be one of the sort of monster players in this business, that even Google, didn't quite understand this and didn't invest in, you know, their deep mind group was doing amazing work with AlphaGo mm -hmm. and with a lot of the, they were going down a very different direction and doing amazing work in AI, but they were under investing in this. And something came to light about a week ago that it seems like Google in the sort of race to like chase open AI, which is, you know, just wholly fucked up, you know, that we're in this, now this sort of arms race, commercial, commercial arms race. But in, in the race to do that, it seems like some engineers at Google were using chat GPT in order to train the Google model. And so the BARD model that they were trying to bootstrap on top of Lambda's BARD, the name of the Google model, model. is BARD. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an interesting name that they chose. Yes. Yeah. And now, yeah, all these names are super interesting, mm. right? And now I think that they've internally, they're calling it Gemini. We'll see what they, whether they keep the public name as Bard. But this stuff is just moving really quickly, Dimitri. You were telling me before that the cost is also dropping enormously. Yeah. How does that work exactly? And what, what can you put some numbers behind that? Yeah, so I think I mean that has been that's been also an, a real surprise to me, and I think it's the assumption was that in order to train these models that you would have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars of compute, and there is you know a tremendous amount of compute resources, you know, sort of Nvidia, highly specialized GPUs. Think about like your kid's gaming computer, mm. like highly tuned and thousands of these machines running and training these models. Last year, you know, the the sort of one of the big events uh, last year was the release of the visual model DALI, which came from OAI and was like this kind of incredible model where you could basically ask it to compose visual images, right? Show me a, you know, make a painting. You've been posting about that too. So all yeah. the different AI artwork that was coming out. Yeah. Yeah, so, and it was kind of fun, beautiful, and interesting. That particular model, the DALI model, probably cost, I mean, we don't know, but probably cost north of 100 million to train. Stability came out in August with their version, competing version of DALI, 
and Stability AI, you know, have been public that their version cost you know less than ten million dollars to train. You guys are investors in Stability. Yeah, yeah, too, we're right? investors in Stability. But that was truly remarkable. And you talk to the founder of Stability, not only did they manage to do the training for a fraction of the cost, but they also managed to compress the actual model down. And they've now got a version that you can run on an M2 laptop. And so the speed at which these things are and the sort of deflation of the cost of creation of these models is kind of remarkable. I do not know, here's a question for you, which I is, will that be applied across all modalities? Like, does that apply to text? And so there's some indicators, there's, you know, I saw a report this week that somebody is saying that they can sort of gin up and get a GPT 3.5 trained for $850,000. If that's true, that is going to be another radical step in that price compression. But it also will say, hey, this actually applies to text also. Because, you know, I was wondering after, you know, that the release of those visual models, will this actually work with text? Or is text different in some way? Is it just more complicated? Is it just much wider possibility space and computational space? What is your sense of where the conversation is right now, the public conversation around this, and how closely aligned is, do you think, to what we should actually be asking? And then what are those questions that we should be asking? Because this has hit the public out of nowhere. Yeah, People are still in the level of like, kind of stunned by it, sharing pictures. Like most recently, what people were sharing were these images that were generated of Trump being arrested on the day of his uh, arraignment at the Southern District of New York. We've seen deep fakes becoming increasingly more convincing over the last few years. So we kind of knew that this was coming. So I feel like part of what's also happening, John, is that we're beginning to realize now that we're starting, we're getting closer and closer to, I don't want to use the word the singularity, because that has very specific connotations. But in that sort of sense, the singularity, like geometrically speaking, like we're closer to that thing where we're living inside of the moment that we've all sort of been anticipating. Yeah, 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 I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, people talk about the path to AGI and they talk use the term takeoff, right? And I think we're on the runway. <laughs> And do we how even long know it, what that means? Like, no, what, what does it mean to no, be? What does AGI don't. even mean? You know, we like, don't. We yeah. don't. Right. Yeah. And if we had created an AGI, I think that the last thing the AGI would want us to know is that it was actually a generalized intelligence, because we would then regulate and place some constraints around that. So, a, how would we, we wouldn't even know it. We can't define it. Totally. But to go back to your question about how people are perceiving it, look, I think that we've seen this sort of insane adoption curve, which is remarkable. But another thing that's remarkable is that I think we've seen society engage with this in a different way with tech, because the way that we've engaged with tech for you know, 30, 50 years as the next shiny toy, where we've gone through mm. this sort of honeymoon period of complete entrancement that last several years with social media, with our phones, with it's gone through that very, very quickly, right? And so, yes, there's a, a large number of people who are totally entranced with it at days I am. But you also have, like, you know, last week I saw Peggy Noonan, right? Peggy Noonan, like the Reagan's- column, The Wall Street Journal columnist? Yeah, she was Reagan's speechwriter, right? Mm -hmm. And she wrote a piece. Right when there was the call to pause development or the open letter training. That was... Yeah, well, and she wrote a piece saying we shouldn't pause, we should stop. She was like, if this is like fire, we should stop. We should just stop and think carefully about what we're doing as a society. So we can have a discussion about the statement, but the fact that Peggy Noonan is like chiming in on this is totally remarkable. And I think is actually very healthy. It's freaking a lot of people out. I think it's very healthy. Yeah. I think we are we're actually having the conversations now that we should have been having early on with social media, that we should have been having, you know, early days of the internet, right? I was I think we talked about it on our first podcast, mm. but I mean I was just entranced with the possibility mm. and the dream of distributed network, distributed communication and giving everybody the power to speak and the the implications for that. And I don't think we sort of thought through, you know, what the downsides were. Mm. So 
So I think we're dealing with this really differently, which I think is good. Totally. I mean, that's a great analogy. You have a great story that you tell about how you drove up to Boston to go on the internet. Yeah. 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 You remember that? That was yeah. 90, 93. 93. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what you said. And also, it's so important to recognize how different the country was, the culture was. So this was 30 years ago. It was two years after the end of the Cold War officially three or, or four years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a real sense of opportunity and less fear around technology. I mean, we had just gone through, uh, around 1992, I think was when Terminator 2 came out. And even Terminator 2, I feel like was a kind of a more optimistic view around technology because Arnold Schwarzenegger had become a hero in the movie. Yeah. You know, and like we go through these cycles, right? We're, we're scared of things and then we develop new relationships around it. The Japanese in the same way with their Godzilla right. allegory of nuclear war, and then eventually, you know, finding a way to actually convert nuclear technology to their benefit, et cetera. So I feel like we're but, now- at Yeah, I grew I mean, I grew up in London, right? Parents, English and French. And, you know, in the 70s, 80s, you know, time of, as we moved into the 80s, a time of a lot of opportunity and a lot of like openness, mm -hmm. but in the 70s and- you know, a lot of fear, a lot of fear of nuclear, a lot of fear and hangover from the war, right? Both my parents were in the war. You know, one side of my family, grandparent ended up in the camps. So really? a lot of like sort of overlay of the Second World War, you know, just growing up with that sort of cloud. And then coupled with that, you know, when I was a kid, you know, the IRA were very active. You know, I just remember like, you know, hearing bombs go off in London mm. and everybody sort of being on edge. You know, a little bit. There was always that little bit of edge. And yet we got on with life. But, you know, life was there was darkness that sort of in the eighties and nineties, I think we just went through just this incredible, you know, sort of halcyon just this incredible period of openness, growth, and possibility. And now we're moving into a different chapter. Does it feel like we're entering something similar? Yeah. yeah that it feels, period? It feels like, I think that there's more sort of like spirals of cycles. They're not yeah. the replications. Fractals. Yeah. But we're going, you know, What is it that. that makes it feel that way to you? Because it's interesting that you say that. So you you were you were a kid in like the middle of seventies or so. Yeah. Because obviously, like I you know, I was born in nineteen eighty one, so I didn't experience that. But when I read the literature, watch the films for the period, there is this kind of sense of a greater degree of darkness. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Whether it's like a depiction of gangs in the streets or yeah. the the inflation or like what was that movie Network where yeah. he gets out and then he's screaming, people yeah. are screaming through the window. Yeah. So you could even feel it through the artwork of the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, the artwork is a cultural expression, but you could feel it. You can feel it in your soul and you feel it in the in the culture and in the moment. And I think our time now you can feel is a time of uh, it's a time of opposition. It's a time of massive change, and and those you know sort of the country, the changes in the economy. You know, I think that you know if you think about this century, right, and you just think about sort of like in my mind from nine eleven, two thousand and eight, COVID, right. Mm. You know, just as a society, we just didn't deal that well with these things, right? Mm. With COVID, I was in the camp and like those movies where, you know, something happened like COVID and all the smartest people in the world got together and sorted it out. And what did we do? All the smartest people in the world, we, well, we all went into our respective corners and just like, you know, did everything we can to basically argue with each other. Mm. And so you could just see that the degree of cooperation, which you would hope would happen in something like that, just didn't happen. And so I think this our society is fraying and you can see we're going through an evolution and a change and it feels very much like, you know, that, that period when I was young. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like another thing that we're living through now is a, there's like a deep existential doubt that people have about the sustainability of our way if we've lost our way, if something needs to change. And there's a kind of lingering existential fear, you know? Yeah. And like a lot of that stuff was going on, it was in the culture with climate change for a while. But what's really interesting is it feels like what was more true was not the climate change, it was the fear. And that fear has moved 
it it isn't just with climate change. It's with AI. It's with a lot of different things. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like there's something deeper that we're tapped into. Yeah. I mean, I think that it became very profound with terrorism, which was sort of like early massively, absolutely. massively overplayed. But the culture like stepped into it and like, and we became obsessed with it. And, and what's interesting about that, John, too, and I want you to go with that, I just want to also throw this out because I was thinking about this and I didn't mention it, was in the 2001 terrorist attacks and in the, in the 2008 crisis, there was still enough social trust in the institutions and in leadership to hand off the football, so to speak, right? Yeah. There were some doubts in 2008. In 2001, it was full. They just gave the reins of power over. Yeah. It just 2008. There were some concerns because we had the lingering effects of the Iraq War and some of the stuff that came out of that war and revelations about how the administration lied. But in COVID, there was like zero trust. Yeah, you know. And I think that's also kind of what makes this moment particularly anxiety-producing because this is potentially. I mean, even the most benign outcomes of what we're seeing now with AI, these suites of technology that we call AI, the most benign outcome is extremely disruptive to people's daily life and will require some kind of public response to kind of mitigate and yeah. manage. Yeah. Because we've seen the effects of opening up of globalization in the 1990s and how disruptive those things were. This is way more disruptive. So that's the most benign outcome. The most dangerous outcome is that we kill all of humanity. This is what people in the field are worried about, yeah. that they're ascribing some percentage. I think the, the number I've seen is like 10% chance. I mean, these numbers are total BS. No one has any idea. It's just a feeling, but that tells you something. Yeah. And we've cried wolf so many times, and there's this doom porn content engine that exists today where people monetize fear. And so we, even when I'm talking about this, I'm like, well, I don't want to sit here and and we're gonna, and I also want people to know this that like this is a very important thing for both of us that we we're gonna actually talk about ways forward because yeah. I think that's where we need to be. But so it's a wicked moment. Yeah, I think one of the other things. So so a few comments. So one is that I think something which is really different from back in the at least previous periods when I was alive is that there was also parallel narratives of hope and opportunity and also of new systems. And today, as we've gone through this cycle, we're, you know, we've basically just grasping the old systems, right? Mm. Sort of see the resurgence of Marxism is insane, right? And I'm not only talking about like what the CCP and what's happening in China, but also and sort of the evolution of sort of like what Xi has done with sort of a, you know, democratic sheen on top of a Marxist engine. But you look here in the United States and you look at sort of like parts of the sort of progressive language and, you know, sort of a system is, you know, drawn from, you know, sort of a Marxist textbook mm -hmm. because it's essentially based on an underlying presumption of power dynamics. And so maybe Marx had it all right, right? And so maybe fine, but the fact that we're not like developing new theories mm. of society and of mind and of future and of future possibility, you know, that's part of what I think we need to start to do. Mm. Because look, in a real sense, last century only started in about 1920. So maybe that will happen again. Maybe, you know, all this, as you described it, darkness and where we're going, what it does is it, you know, the counter forces or the counter, mm. so it starts to rise and people start to, you know, people became very lethargic, right? It's like our basic freedoms, our basic, you know, they just became presumed and people became lethargic. And now people, I think, when they see what's happening in Ukraine, when they see what's happening in China, when they see what's happening here in the United States, they look and they say, okay, I need to actually start to say what I believe mm. and make sure that my actions are consistent with that. So I think that there is a, a rise of, you know, the counter forces of this will start to rise. And I think you see indications of that. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I, there were like two parallel thoughts that were going on in my head. One was comparing the rate of technological change or progress today versus 100 years ago. And of course, I'm so biased to immediately say it's just much faster today. And it's true, I think. But also, and it, so it's really caught us off guard. I, I feel like the real changes, John, really began the last 10 years. Really, 2012 for me is just the date. And for me, I think it's really when 
the iPhone merge with a lot of these mobile social media applications. That is, I don't know if that's, you know, what everyone else feels, but, you know, in the early 20th century, a lot of the environmental degradation caught people, I think, by surprise. Mm -hmm. You know, like look at the, the extinction of the buffalo, the wild buffalo. You know, that happened because of the railroads. It wasn't a direct consequence. You know, we, we built all these railroads and all of a sudden, within a short period of time, you know, we were driving these animals that had been a staple food source on the continent to extinction. I don't want to kind of overstate that. There was something else I was going to mention. I think it was you were talking about... I was forking to the counter forces, right? All these sort of the, the dialectical nature of... I mean, look, I think one of the things that's profoundly difficult about this, right, is technology is not simple, right? There's sort of one of the... I was just on vacation and one of the pieces I went back and reread re was Heidegger's piece on technology. You know, the question concerning technology. Mm. And technology is not neutral, right? But it's also not good or bad. And there's profoundly ambiguous nature to technology. And we are complicit in the both creation and the evolution of the, the technology. And so technologies and you know Heidegger, I think, would just be his brain would explode if he could see Chat GPT because the relationship and that sort of complicit, you know, sort of evolution that's happening. That symbiosis. That symbiosis that's happening as we pay attention and as our attention and our brains adapt to this, and as the assumptions and the models of what we think this is make this what we think it is, I think is a very sort of complicated part of the hall of mirrors that we're in, right? You go back to, totally. you know, we started at the beginning of the century, right? With 9-11, right? I think of Adam Curtis and there's, you know, a bunch of evidence that Al-Qaeda was kind of like this fringe group. And we, like through the media and through narrative storytelling, mm -hmm. we helped construct a it's narrative big, around Al-Qaeda and the narrative around fear, which then you know, gave a lot of power to certain you know, groups in our society and you know, people and large groups of people will take power when they can. Mm. But these narratives and these sort of fictions get created. And so, you know, sort of like you referred to chat GPT as autocomplete. We've got kind of this autocomplete of attention that's happening it's sort of this recursive model that is going back and forth between us and technology. And I think our relationship and the essence of technology is very ambiguous. And I think we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that there are some technologies that we will develop that we need to just be able to agree to turn off. And that is, I mean, like you and I talked about earlier with gain of function research. You know, we don't need to get into a discussion of the politics of what could have happened. But, you know, I have, my opinion there isn't useful. What I think my only point is, is that is a form of research that we as a society should have had a conversation about and said, this is actually not mm. a form of research that we want to be conducted. And if we do want it to be conducted, maybe it needs to be conducted on, like, do it on on spaceships or something, you know? So this actually gets to, I think, a really interesting avenue of conversation. Let's just focus on the United States. This is true also for European societies. I'd argue even more true because I feel like there's a healthier democratic culture in Europe and a lot of the European countries than there is in America. And I think that's a function of the police state. I think it's a function, or the police state is a function of empire. America mm -hmm. is an empire and... I think that a lot of the democratic culture in our country has been sacrificed on the altar of empire. And I wonder to what degree our notions of what America is and the role of the people and the sovereign citizen is actually accurate in terms of where we are today. In other words, we have these conversations, et cetera, but to what degree is there a path between the conversations and where people are, are at and what they're talking about and action in the parts of society and the government and the institutions that are actually wield and have the power and in the companies which are more powerful than they've been at any point in my life. You know, like Google, OpenAI, et cetera. These are incredibly powerful corporations and organizations of individuals. 
are we operating with the right model of governance yeah. in our head? So in other yeah. words, are we trying to effectuate change in the right way or are we just kind of talking, but we're not actually organizing in the right way in order to effectuate change? So let me come at that from a different direction, but I think that it definitely resonates with me. I mean, I think that our information systems have been, you know, and our, the architecture of our information system has been flattened. And so we now have access to any piece of information in the world, which, you know, back in, you know, the 90s was just like blowing my brain and like, oh my God, this can be amazing for everyone. Mm. But as a consequence to that, I think we've lost some, if not a lot of ability to cognitively construct sort of frameworks around information mm. to basically like create these sort of, you know, I think about them as sort of stack of beliefs and assumptions. And how do those things, how does what you believe around the world, about the world actually get constructed? And very specifically, I think software developers and have done an incredibly poor job of like giving you tools to be able to like organize and mm. stack your beliefs and around information. So we just have, so we have all this information. It's but a fire hose. It's fire hose and we're drinking from the fire hose or we're being flooded by it. It's not knowledge, right? It's not like if you think about sort of a very sort of like go back to the Greeks, right? And you just think about sort of the quest of knowledge and the quest of self-knowledge. This is just like, this is just a fire hose of crap, mm. right? So we could talk about the fire hose and we can talk about the sort of the chaos dynamics of the fire hose and how that's being used and manipulated. But I think that go back to the institutions, our institutions are still operating mostly in this hierarchical structure. And so we haven't figured out if we have a flattened network information architecture, we don't have a governance architecture that is particularly networked. Now, I would say particularly, I would say a lot of things I agree with you about Europe versus the States versus the US, but I do think that the federal state system in the US is actually resembles more of a network architecture. Mm. You know, where there's a lot that happens at a local level and then because of the European Union, you're talking yes. about the supernational. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think that the in Europe there's a lot on the democratic side to like, but I think that the super totally. state of the EU has become, you know, sort of an overarching problem. Absolutely. No, I mean I totally agree with that. You know, Michael Sakasis and I in our, our his previous appearance, it comes it was right before your episode talked about this. He's written a piece. I don't remember what the title of the piece was, but it might have been called something about narratives, but he talked about the metaphor of the database and that we're just in this database that grows ever larger in size. And the logic of being able to make sense of the data hasn't grown commensurately. Right. And people are overwhelmed that it's created a lot of confusion and people aren't able to differentiate. I mean, like the Ukraine war is a perfect example. That to me, and I've talked about this on the show before, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia was a watershed for me. You know, and I'm someone who worked at RT, produced a show on a Russian network. So I, in other words, I saw the belly of the beast and the propaganda machine, but I also had the nuance to be able to differentiate. At the time, I remember when Mitt Romney was talking about how Russia was a huge threat and uh, I thought it was ridiculous. And I think there was, a, and then similarly when the Democrats were, you know, pushing the whole Russia narrative during the 2016 cycle. I also thought it was completely overdone. And I had a lot of people on like John Mearsheimer and my old professor, Stephen Cohen on the podcast to discuss, to explore that view. But that didn't prevent me from underseeing the invasion of Ukraine for what it was yeah. and the danger that it represented and assigning blame exactly where it belonged. Yeah. But what I saw was how that, not only was that invasion spun through this disinformation machine, which again, this word disinformation, I mean, I haven't read this article yet, but there's a writer named Jacob Siegel who's published something on this. I actually want to read it. I started listening to an interview that he gave and there's this kind of an, an of course, there's an acknowledgement that disinformation is a term that governments most certainly use to their benefit. So they want to label more things as disinformation, even if they go against the government, even if they're not, but there really is a disinformation paradigm here. And anyway, I just remember, you know, what that the invasion of Ukraine, you know, in the lead up to Ukraine, lots of educated people were saying that it was a hoax, that it wasn't going to happen. Then when it did happen, 
They had all sorts of other crazy theories, like the ruble was going up as Russia was was being sanctioned, and the ruble was going up because rubles weren't being exchanged for dollars. People were saying, coming up with theories, this was a sign that you know some Putin playing three D chess. I mean, there was all sorts of insane narratives all over the internet, and just people aren't equipped to differentiate with those things because right. people use heuristics to decide what's true and not true, and usually the heuristics are institutions, governments, you know, right. leaders, and. So we're in this like incredibly difficult time for people where you're just fighting to establish credibility. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a loss. I think that the heuristics are missing, right? Sort of that's the modeling and the frameworks. I think the narratives become like really powerful and like get into our sort of lower brainstem. And, you know, we become obsessed with narratives and some of these narratives are just complete bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like with... With Putin, right? I there was na the narrative that I had prior to the invasion was that he was basically a kleptocrat, and that this was a sort of you know a completely dysfunctional state, and that there was no ideology, right? And one of the things that you know after the invasion, I became you know for a couple of weeks, I became obsessed, like sort of reading a lot about the sort of some of the core ideology. Of you know, sort of the Eurasia, Mother Russia, the imperial, imperial Alexander Dugin, all of these sort of like you know mm. fringe fascist ideology that seems to underpin some of this. Mm. There's also sort of a really strange sort of like religious mm. component to this. Yeah, I don't know, but a lot of that stuff I think is also opportunistic. And some of it's also just narratives that get created after the fact. And so I think that we don't have the heuristics, we don't have the narratives. And we've also, I just want to say, I think we become really like confused by metaphor. And so, you know, metaphors are these incredibly powerful things that we as human beings use to think and to like construct mm. mental models of the world. But, you know, use the word, I cannot in society now use the word deep state. Mm. I believe that the systems, you know, sort of like go back to like, was it Eisenhower and the- mm -hmm. Military industrial yeah, congressional complex. complex, right? And that to me was a form of the deep state, right? And so, but I can't use that word now because- It means so many th different things now at this point to people because it's been used so deliberately. It's been used so deliberately that it's no, no longer a metaphor. It is now like completely attached to both the political ideology and also a part of the political spectrum mm. that it just becomes meaningless. Just like disinformation. Yeah. So I have a few thoughts about that. One, I think when we think about the deep state, another way to think about it, we were talking about chat GPT and we see these emergent behaviors institutions working in networks exhibit emergent behaviors and there's an emergent intelligence. So I think for people that hear deep state and think that this is some kind of conspiracy, it's not. It's like, you know, where power is, it accumulates and networks of people operating in the shadows, you know, are able to exert power over a system. So a few things that I wanted to comment on and then we'll move into the second part of the conversation, John. I want listeners to go back and listen to my conversation with Peter Pomerantsev because I thought that was like his book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible was just a, a really impactful book for me that put a kind of framework around the nihilism and cynicism promoted by the Putin government and the brand of propaganda out of Russia. Because, you know, historically, like when we think of Soviet era propaganda, it was, it was also very ideological and was trying to push back against the American capitalist Christian, you know, propaganda model with their own sort of atheistic, communist, you know, alternative. But in, in this case, so much of what is actually comes out of Russia is really about or has been about question. I mean, even it's right there in RT's subtitle, question more. You know, it looks innocuous, but it's actually meant, and who doesn't want to question more? We should question. This is part of the problem with the whole disinformation thing that's happening, right? Like we've lost trust in our institutional, in our leadership for good reason. And so the opposition weaponizes that by telling us, well, you should question them. Well, of course we should question them. But in so doing, the goal, I think, is to undermine our sense of reality. So there's this one parallel process that's happening, and there are people that are complicit in that, both knowingly and unknowingly, within our own societies, who are working to undermine our own societies. And you and I have talked about this. There's this insurgent element, and I've talked about it too, and written about it on Twitter. 
There's also the culture war. And this is incredibly important. I think a lot of people miss this. And I think Democrats are largely sort of AWOL on this whole issue. And I think the most interesting idea is actually about how to reform society and do it in a way that is supportive of the human being and that works for people are actually coming out of the right, not out of the left. And I think that what Putin has done is he has held himself up as the sort of guardian of tradition and the guardian of like, you know, the world that a lot of people understand and that resonates with them. And so what you have is people on the right, a lot of people on the American right and in Europe, people that are, and again, the right is such a kind of inexact term. It's a bunch of concentric circles. A lot of people see Putin, they say, I can relate to him more. There's something more relatable about him, what he stands for. And they're willing to support him and his policies because of that sort of feeling like, you know, and I've seen it even in my friends, forget just my friends here in the US, I've seen it also in some of my friends in Greece. It's even more urgent right. to push back against Putin, to support NATO. But because of this larger sort of woke movement and woke ideology on the progressive side, and again, these are nebulous terms and they could mean different things for different people, but this kind of authoritarian push on the progressive side that isn't liberal, a lot of people don't know who their allies are. They actually don't. There's this like a crisis of national and communal identity. And people don't know, like, who is my brother? Who is my sister? Like, who am I part of? Like, what yeah. is, what? Do, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that underneath this, not solely, but one of the biggest drivers of this is technological change. Totally. And the shifts underneath, because I think that you know, with that shift in trust of institutions, shift in trust amongst, you know, people, I think that you see these technologies like artificial intelligence and you just see just how much it is going to transform society. I mean, I do not believe that we are on a path to a generalized, you know, sort of super intelligence with the current technology. I believe that, you know, human intelligence and human interaction, right, is only a fragment of that actually happens through language. And so I think a part of intelligence is embodied and is mm. present in, in our physical mm. representation. I do think that we are going to, as a species, we are going to develop machine-like intelligences. I distinguish them and think about them as a different intelligence, just like I wake up in the morning and I talk to my dog and I think about my dog as a different intelligence that I respect, you know, his ability to smell and his ability to do things I can't do, or like my calculator that's smarter and faster than me in bumpteen ways. So it's not this conversation and obsession with human intelligence and replicating human intelligence, which is, you know, thousands of years of history, going back to Prometheus and going back to our desire to be gods and to be able to create mm. and to create. It's Frankenstein, it's all, all of those narratives are being played out again. Mm. And I think that the actual, you know, what's actually happening is that we are creating these other forms of intelligence that have the potential to be amazingly assistive to us as a species hmm. and have the potential to, you know, to liberate us, you know, from our minds, our bodies, our planet, you know, to do amazing things, to, to understand possibility space, right? Like one of the things which I was obsessed with and fascinated with in the early days of AI with Kasparov. You know, I actually, I went to see Kasparov and Deep Blue play. Really? Yeah. I was young. It was here in Manhattan. It was at like the Hilton Hotel. I like faked a, like a lanyard with saying that I was on the press so I could get in. There weren't blogs back then, but I've forgotten what I put on it, but I just made something up. And it was like 50 people in the room and it was dead boring. Right, because it was like this, you know, sort of like this guy in a suit, you know, from IBM who would like go and consult the computer mm. and then move. But one of the things that I think was fascinating about Deep Blue and again about AlphaGo is that you see that we as humans, we explore a very narrow possibility space, right? So in the case of AlphaGo, you had it finding solutions that humans had never considered 
thousands of years, 2,000 years of playing mm. this game Go. And just like certain combinations of moves for cultural reasons and specific patterns mm. in how we do things, we just never done. And so that's the possibility space, right? There's this immense possibility mm. space around any problem. I don't care if it's like finding a new antibiotic or if it's like solving climate change. These tools can give us a ability to explore possibility space in a much, much more dynamic fashion. And we're going to be able to do amazing things if we don't fuck it up. Mm. Because while I don't think we're on a path now to a general intelligence, we will get there. And having the conversation now and understanding how we want to, you know, do we want this to be in the hands of corporations? Do we want it to be in the hands of governments? Do we want it to be in the hands of, you know, small groups of people? if these models can get so small that we want it to be in the hands of everyone, those are the conversations we need to have because this is time to actually shape it. Yeah. So I'm going to move us to the second part of this conversation, John. I want to throw a few you things were, out. So that's why I was like, I was breathlessly <laughs> like, <laughs> I no, just wanted to get that out. There's no in, commercial breaks in the, here. So in the, we free, don't... In the free section. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank God we can actually go for, for yeah. as long as we need to. Yeah, I want to talk about the alignment problem and the AI control problem because that's kind of, even in the case that we're not talking about artificial general intelligence, goal alignment is something that can present major issues. And being able to bridge that epistemological gap between what we intend or we think we intend and what these systems actually understand. And not only is that itself difficult, but on top of that, they can create sub goals that can be completely unaligned with what we had originally intended. I think also something that's missing that I feel like we need if we want any chance of surviving, and I mean surviving, I don't just mean surviving with some kind of you know dystopian AI vision, but really anything at this point is we need a sense of belief in ourselves. Mm -hmm. As a species, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that we oscillate in these periods as a species where we go through periods where we believe in ourselves. Yeah, I was too young to really remember the Reagan era, but it feels like a lot of what Reagan was and what made Reagan popular was the way in which he stood in opposition to the negativity that seemed to exist in the 1970s around what was possible, what we could do. Again, as someone that didn't live during that period. And so like, there are also a lot of people that keep trying to tell you and me and everyone else that we can't do this, you know? And, oh, you know, you, I feel the same way you do, but I've learned, you know, it's the government's too corrupt and these, but you know what, then you just might as well give up, you know? So I feel like this is very important. I try to do that as best as I can. And in that spirit, what I really want to do in the second part of our conversation, John, is think through how can we begin to tackle this problem? Like, what are the things that people can do? This is something I talked about with Michael Sakasas as well. And Michael's view was that, you know, there are certain things that you can do and certain things you can't do. And that a lot of that, it depends on the scale that you're operating on. And so I think that's an interesting insight as well. But also we may, I don't know to what degree we have the time, you know, to really try to just do things, small potato stuff in our personal lives. But anyway, we can explore that in the second hour. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with John, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. John, Stick around. We're going to move the rest of this conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.